<clears throat> okay, I'll bring this uh, committee to the whole meeting for January the 23rd, 2024, to order. Result of the agenda for this uh, January 23rd, 2024, committee of the whole meeting be adopted. Moved by Councillor Wojcik, seconded by Councillor Powell. All in favor? <coughs> Carried. Three, result of the minutes of the January 9, 2024, Committee of the Whole Meeting be approved. Moved by Councillor Medwood, seconded by Councillor Powell. Discussion? All in favor? It's carried. All right, I'll turn it over to General Government and Finance. Okay, so on 4.1, we've got the accommodation tax bylaw discussion. Um, you see on your agenda attached was the status report, and then uh, the past first reading, and then the current draft. So, Mr. Cooley, do you want to walk us through your status report? Uh, yeah. So, just to review the, the changes that have gone uh, since first reading is a definition or inclusion of short-term rental accommodations and dealing with those. Uh, an exemption for uh, billets for athletic lodging, an exemption for the First Nations group attending primary or secondary school, and the use of the accommodation tax revenue going from tourism, economic development, recreation, active living, and capital infrastructure to recreation and active living. So currently SDRs, uh, uh, just to be clear, they would have to voluntarily submit that operation address or the town would have to, in its undescribed efforts, attempt in finding where they are. So I guess uh, in terms of process, we have sent it off to the, the MSOs for review. We haven't heard anything back. The town has held two public consultations in meeting, and we are scheduling a third private one with the properties that are affected. Uh, and what else? After that is done, so I know there's a, a recent pro process change that I became aware of, is that we do have to pass all three readings. We have to pass the bylaw prior to send sending it to the Lieutenant Governor's Office for approval. If the bylaw cannot be enforced without the approval of the Lieutenant Governor. Uh, just so Council knows, you know, sometimes the public consultations are hard, but they are very necessary. Uh, the province has made it very clear that that is what they're going to be. Uh, I shouldn't say solely, but mainly judging our, our process on is our consultation with the affected properties, and I think we're doing the right thing. Okay, so where do we want to start with this so Do we want to bring up the, the bylaw and work our way through it and address concerns article by article? Council Bob again. Uh, just uh, kind of a question on things. So at the last meeting we tabled this uh, the second reading just wondering how we got to a special meeting when that was decided and why we're here and not. I was under the impression it was February 6th. And I thought maybe the hotels were under the same impression too. So how did we get here? They definitely were. When you table a when you table a, an item, it's automatically or defaulted to the next regular meeting. So it's not in our minutes, but that's one change that will happen is we will write which date it'll go to next. Regardless of that, uh, Section 34.3b of Robert's Rule states a table item can be called in a special meeting, but it must, as long as it's uh, included in the public notice, which it was. So I'm not under the impression we're voting the third reading tonight? No. No? Okay. That's, yeah, I thought it was just one question. Okay, sir. Uh, well, my suggestions would be, yes, we have had two public delegations. However, in delegations, as Mayor pointed out at the last one, 
Council is not allowed to engage in debate or discussion. We're allowed to ask questions. So we have not really had an open discussion with the businesses that are affected by this tax. So personally, I would like to see it remain tabled until we can, as requested, uh, both in those delegations as well as in the written letter from uh, the Super 8 from Mona, actually schedule a meeting for a round table to have those open discussions so that we can actually maybe have some back and forth. And us sitting here talking about what we think is best is not really working with the hotels. So why don't we, before we even do a second reading, sit down with the hotels, have that round table discussion, see what comes back, make amendments if need be, and then do a second reading and move into a third. But that would be my recommendations and suggestions. Council Boychuk. Well, in discussions like with them, I'm hearing the only, the main concern we're hearing from them is fairness and inclusion of the Airbnbs, which is, according to this document that uh, CEO Phil provided with us, what we changed in the accommodation tax after we heard from them the first time, we made sure to include that in there. Um, as far as um, anything else, like the only thing they've spoke to is the Airbnbs and where it's going to, um, as far as what's included in the accommodation tax. As far as I'm recalling, um, and my personal view on where it's going to, no matter what way you slice it, it's the same wallet, same bank account. If they want it to go to here, it goes here, and what we say from here goes over to where you want to put it. it it's it's a mute point in, in my opinion, but um, if I miss something else, like as far as how the accommodation tax is drafted and whether or not it affects a second reading or not, I don't see how it does. Council White. Well, two things. One, I have no problem including the Airbnb, realizing it may be difficult to enforce, but we have to start sometime. So uh, I'm sure that process will evolve over time. I think in a more immediate sense, I see in 32, in any given year, the accommodation of tax will be placed in reserve to use three ways. A, I have no trouble with B, I have no trouble with capital infrastructure. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what council thinks as a whole, but I don't think it should go there. I think it should go to tourism, economic development, recreation, and equity. Council Medley. Um, including a definition for collection or from short-term rentals and actually being able to enforce it are two entirely different things. Not being able to enforce it is just as unfair to have it in there and not be able to enforce it as it is to exclude it altogether. We have no means of registering or regulating or enforcing that collection. So really, it's lip service to a document is what it is. It's still unfair because the only ones we can collect from and enforce that are the hotels. So it's still unfair collection. We still haven't talked or addressed the issue of their concern with starting it right up at 5% and maybe going into some discussions and negotiations about starting at a flat rate fee. I know Councillor Bobick mentioned he feels this needs to be on board and mentioned in the last meeting that maybe we do need to look at a flat rate nominal fee to get going. So that's a discussion that hasn't been had, nor has it been mentioned anything in regards to possibly <coughs> that or amending that. With regards to where the money goes, uh, it's been indicated in Ramona's letter, and it's kind of been mentioned at the discussions that 5% of their business is from recreation. And putting it all to recreation does not increase tourism to our community to potentially give them a little bit of bang for their buck for putting out the effort of collecting it. And they've also mentioned in there they would rather see it to go to initiatives to uh, create a safer community to, and they believe they did mention infrastructure or capital projects. So again, for us to make that decision without sitting down and having an open discussion with them, that's still just council making a decision. 
it's not a discussion. Councilor Bobbick? So, in between two and three readings, can these uh, be altered? This, uh, yes. I'm yeah. sure if a bit of discussion was carried on between two and three. Even at the even at the third reading, there could still be okay. eight amendments. After the third reading, but once the vote's done. The once the reading, vote's done, it's yeah. done. But, it, but before I mean, the vote is done. So if there's a vote tonight, but we still could have a meeting with them and still go on from there for the third reading. Yes. Okay, thank you. <coughs> and I believe, Mr. Poole, there was some effort by administration to maybe coordinate that meeting with. Yeah, we're looking at the the, government, the general government services committee to be meeting with the, the group, and the dates are being discussed right now. Okay. Um, one of the other things I did have a chance to look at the petitions that were uh, left here. Uh, counted a total of 257 signatures. 90% um, of those signatures were out of the valley. 10 were from a Swan River resident and 15 were for, from valley residents. So not even 10% of the signatures on there were people of the community. Um, and then out of the valley, the communities that were signed on the petition were Winnipeg, Dauphin, Flin Flon, Portage, Morden, Brandon, the Paw, Steinbach, and all of these communities charge an accommodation tax in their community. So I find it a little amusing that they will take our money to better their community and stabilize their taxes, but they do not want to contribute the same to our community. And I talk about an unfair playing field for that. Um, and I don't recall having a say if they a say to their community whether or not they charge it to outlying communities um, or where it should be spent. CFO Kanita. I'm just reading an email that was uh, sent to the CAO's assistant from municipal relation. It says the municipality should have preliminary consultations with the accommodation owners in particular to gather information about what the amount of tax should be, what it should be spent on, and the general level of support for the tax amongst these business owners. These discussions should be carefully documented. Um, it says typically we would expect to see that your bylaw has the support of local accommodation owners, that the funding will be dedicated, like likely through a special purpose reserve, to increasing tourism in some way, that it would be in line with the rates charged by other municipalities for consistency, and that it is similar in application administration and enforcement to other municipalities' bylaws. Otherwise, it's more likely that approvals will take much longer and may not be granted. Councilor Powell. Councilor Medley. I do have two questions that came up from uh, Ramona's email. And two of them that pop into mind for me is when I went back and looked at that chart of comparisons, uh, it does not show any comparisons done pertaining to usage rates. So she references the fact that, for example, Brandon, majority of their usage rate is due to tourism, uh, events hosted at the Keystone, uh, sporting, etc., versus uh, business, uh, contractors, government, etc. Whereas we are the reverse, and most of our ho hotel owners are saying that 95% of their business is actually coming from uh, construction business, government agencies, that sort of. So do we have a comparison for these communities that we've done or reached out to to say, see what exactly is their usage rate? Are they a 95 to 5% split the same way we are? Are they the reverse? Like, Are they generating on average more business based on tourism as it is? Or do they get more of their business like our folks that is business. My second question is at my board meeting for services to seniors, we did have um, Rick Wojcik there to discuss some of our issues and concerns regarding funding there. 
And one of the things that was mentioned was that the Manitoba government offered financial support to small businesses to offset costs when they rolled out that, those minimum wage increases occurring in rapid succession. So they actually offered some financial support to help those businesses get through that transition and getting people boosted up. So my question is, is the town willing to offer any kind of financial compensation and support to our accommodation businesses who are going to have to invest? Uh, I believe it was uh, Maureen, she's Thunder Hill, I think, mentioned she just recently purchased new stationery, so she's gonna be looking at putting out a thousand bucks just for replacing stationery, not to mention additional costs to be able to administer the bookkeeping and tracking of this. Our other hotels that are on computer systems have mentioned they may be looking at anywhere from five to $15,000 to update their software to be able to add an additional tax or flat rate fee. So is the town going to be willing to offer some sort of subsidy? Like, are we going to maybe offer that through the initial collection of this tax, we will reimburse for these expenses that they need to put out in order to be able to provide this service of collecting the tax for on behalf of the town. So that might be something to come up in the discussion with the hotels is maybe if we're willing to offer that, maybe that would help ease that expense to them uh, to get through this initial implementation anyways. Your worship. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I'm not too sure about if we need to be hung up on the uh, short-term rentals, <clears throat> removing it or not, because I think it's, at some point in time, it's going to happen. Uh, <coughs> oh yeah, we, there's no teeth in the bylaw for us right now. Who knows if it could happen in some in the short time, you know, perhaps within this year. I'm not too sure. Depends on what the province decides on, but <clears throat> I guess that could be more of a debate. I had spoke with the city of Doff and the mayor in particular <clears throat> about their accommodation tax, and he said that 70% goes to recreation and 30% goes to economic development for tourism, and what they have an adventure fund. The PAW, 50%, uh, goes to an enhancement, a community enhancement uh, reserve fund, 25% goes to recreation reserve fund, and 25% goes to a destination marketing fund. So it's all kind of with recreation and with, uh, within the two of them. <clears throat> My thoughts with the round table, you know, because we did talk a little bit about this with some of the hotel people in the last <coughs> and that we would, the general government would have to <coughs> sit down and chat with them after, and before the third reading, and talk about, um, you know, whatever they, you know, just to kind of uh, smooth the waters over a little bit if we can, and um, hear some concerns. And, and if there is, in my opinion, it's only in my opinion that if we could help with the transition to, I know kind of Councilor Medlin had mentioned that, <coughs> that's what I'm kind of thinking of as the same as helping with that transition to. See you, Paul. Just to answer one of those questions from Councilor Medlin, uh, we do ask for the specific usage stats. Uh, they do send information, but they're not required to give us statistics so nothing that we can say is definitive I guess. But the question was asked. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so just in response to the assistance to the uh, transition of this, in paragraph uh, 10 <coughs> of the bylaw it actually speaks to a whole back fee for administration purposes for the hotel. So some thought has already been put into that. I believe uh, Lorene McDill, when she spoke, it was $800 to get her uh, paper uh, documentation printed. And also speaking to the POS system there, I believe four out of the five of our uh, hotels are all manual right now. Um, and I also believe that the Super 8s is uh, capable of uh, just inserting the accommodation tax, however it may be proposed. Um, so could that be a question that we could pose to them yeah. what the state of their POS system is? That was one of my questions I have for later is which POS systems do each of these hotels operate on now? 
because um, I did a little research on those as well. And uh, from what I gathered, uh, some POS, POS systems typically cost $1,700 upfront investment and $1,400 a year for software. Um, and there's also no requirement that they need to update a POS system or go to a POS system. If they've been using a manual system all this time, they're more than welcome to continue on with that method. Um, it would be no difference than how they remit their GST and PSD. Um, it would be the same as how they would work out that accommodation tax. And then as far as the utilization of the rooms, I spoke with one of the hotel owners and it's basically the same professionals um, <coughs> using it in Brandon versus Swan River. Um, Brandon has the Horseshore Egg Show, Swan River has a Stampede. When a big draws for the Jets and Moose game, Swan River draws for the Stampeders. What's the difference? Are we less valued because we are a smaller community? If anything, because we are a smaller community, we need to think outside the box to use other methods of revenue streams and not be solely reliable on taxation of the residents. Um, and when I was speaking with that individual, uh, confirmed that most of their uh, users are contractors, salespeople, and auditors, and they are all used to paying it everywhere they go, and it's also a tax write-off for them. And another comment that was made is that the accommodation tax is almost in all communities in Northern America. It's been around for four decades. It's nothing new. Our hotels have been contacted in 2012 and 2017 previously, and again now, after we have the draft, it took us a year to draft this accommodation tax. It's not like it was rushed through. It's not like it hasn't been thought out. Um, there's been a lot of thought put into it. Um, and then speaking to the 5% for recreation, I just did quick math, and 365 <coughs> days in a year is 156 days or weekends, roughly 42%. So there's a lot of weekends in there and, and uh, used for things, and I don't know. And it really has no relevance on what the breakdown of usage is. Um, from the letter we got from the uh, short-term rental or the Airbnb, it says often they're called because our hotels are booked solid. That that's, that's when they're getting a call for usage of theirs. Um, but I do believe we should be including the Airbnbs right off the hop, uh, like uh, Mayor Jacobson said. Even though there might not be teeth in it to enforce it, um, Winnipeg is currently working on that right now. And as soon as that um, information is available or that, how do you say, enforcement uh, is there, I, I would why we would not start enforcing it. Mr. White? I keep hearing the number thrown out that 95% of our clients are not recreational, and I would question it. How do you derive that 5% might be recreational? The last time I stayed at a hotel, nobody asked me why I'm here. I'm here for recreation, I'm here for business, whatever. So I'm assuming the other clients are not saying and for your hockey tournament or for curling. So uh, I'd like to know what to base that data on when you say 95% is. I'm guessing, I use that word deliberately, I'm not saying it is 95% although I'm guessing it's significantly higher than that. Council Medley. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you're Three things, uh, just because you're the last one to speak. Uh, if you read Ramona's email, she gave a more detailed breakdown as to how she determined recreation versus corporate. So it is in her email. She also offered an invite uh, to yourself or anyone else who would like further breakdown or to be shown physically. She is open to coming down and having a, a chat with her. Uh, thought, well thought out by council. We did not engage hotels in the thinking out process of this accommodation tax until we had our first draft. And since we put that first draft out, we have been, in my opinion, very reluctant to have any give whatsoever on what we put in there with regards to the rate of the tax, where the money is going to, and who will or will not be, it will be enforced on when it rolls out. Uh, with regards to the communities who have been implementing this tax for a long time, they also implemented it prior to Airbnbs becoming a huge competition <coughs> and for uh, relevance in communities. 
So at their time, they're not sitting at the same stage we are. We are sitting in a predicament where these are active. We have a significant number of them. And for us to move forward and not be able to enforce it on all, that is just to use Ramona's example from her email, like saying, uh, depending on your furniture store, if you're operating a furniture store out of 800 square feet versus 2,000 square feet, you don't have to pay this tax. But if you're operating out of a furniture store that has X amount of square footage, then you are going to have to collect this tax. So where do you think people are going to shop for their furniture? They're going to go to the one that doesn't have the 5% extra tax on them. So. Again, it's unfair to stick it in a bylaw knowing full well that we have no means of enforcing it goes against the whole point of having a law. A law is meant to be enforced and not to pick and choose what parts of it that we can or can't enforce. So I also read uh, Ramona's correspondence and went through it point by point and it speaks to the residential versus commercial and the capability of a house output for garbage, water, sewer consumption versus a hotel of numerous rooms or, and guests. Uh, I agree they don't have near the expenses but they also don't have near the capacity for earning revenue. I do feel they should be included in this bylaw right from the start whether there's enforcement options are released by the province or not. Uh, we, that is the point of our discussions with the hotels. We hear their concerns and feel that there should be a fair playing field with respect to saying. Um, the other point she had made in a correspondence was pushing customers elsewhere. Uh, my question is where are they going to go? 172 kilometers to Dauphin, 229 kilometers to the Paw. These communities already charge the accommodation tax, never mind the gas to get there. Um, I believe the customer service provided by our hoteliers in our community is second to none and the passion they have brought forward regarding this accommodation tax speaks to that. They are their customers and they're not going to go anywhere, I don't believe. Um, as far as where the revenue should go, um, it's a recurring theme uh, as far as that. I mean, recreation is included in just about every one of the communities we've surveyed. Um, as far as the rates, that is the standard rate within the province, we are well within that. Um, if we would have started it in 2012, maybe we would have started at a lower rate. Um, like previously stated, out of the community's research, 90% charge the 5% as stipulated by the province. Only one charge is a flat rate. The flat rate provides the least amount of revenue, while the 5% while the generates uh, anywhere from 2022 for the PAW was over 206,000. The PAW joined in 2016 of seven years. They've made $1,442 uh, that their taxpayers haven't had to pay. Thompson, since 2009, right when it started, they've been in it for 14 years. They have made uh, $8,932,000. Dauphin has only been in it for 20 years at just around 279,000 per year. In three years, they've made 837000 and Winnipeg's been in it since 2008 with a yearly revenue of $13,769,000. That's 15 years. They have made $206,535. Um, the town has been said to be rushing into this, and again, I state in 2012 and 2017, it was attempted the estimated potential for our earning in our community to save our taxpayers and to stabilize our taxes is $250,000 a year. Um, 2012, if we would have been in it for the past 11 years, we would have potentially have made $2,750,000 of revenue that would have saved our taxpayers' taxes and reduced our borrowing capacity. Um, just a few comments to make. <coughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, so the discussion with uh, uh, one of the representatives that was here, along with reading the Moda's uh, letter, um, in regards to where the money goes in the, under Section 32, um, I have a willingness, and it doesn't matter 
one way or the other. But uh, I'm open to like where the money goes to either to be classified towards police protection to address that. Like, we've got GIS coming, we've got police. That's all services that anybody at the hotels uses. Um, so a portion could be put towards police protection. Another portion could be put towards debt servicing, i.e. earmarked for recreation debt servicing. Uh, for it, we got the pool, we got arena, we got oodles of recreation debt that can be covered off of that. Um, and also, we're uh, like a, a kitty or put towards funding towards major event funding like to bring events here where it'll utilize uh, people coming here to utilize the hotels more. Um, so that it's not just recreation per se, but address some of the concerns that one of the hotel had wrote in that thing that this is a broad base that it could be applied to at whatever percentages or from year to year. Um, in section 10, I'm also where we're currently, it has in the, the bylaw uh, $50 per quarter. I'm apt to <coughs> discussing that with them to see what they would feel would be appropriate to uh, administer that. Uh, and collect because if they're paying twenty dollars an hour, that's only two and a half hours per quarter to, to collect that. They may need more than that, but that was based on a twenty dollar per hour wage for their firm. So, so I'm apt to discuss that with them and see what their feelings are. And then just a, a general comment is that the accommodation tax, uh, the, the town we have to get revenue from somewhere, and this is a, an opportunity or a that's been utilized in all communities throughout the province and elsewhere, um, where revenue is generated by non-taxpayers. We're gonna still need that revenue at one point in time, whether that is based on non-ratepayers or passed on to these exact businesses along with every other business and ratepayer in the valley. So I think in our discussion with them, we could have that discussion with them is that do they want to be part of the collecting where we can bring it in from outside sources or are they more willing to pay a bigger burden on their annual property taxes or business taxes? Uh, it's coming one way or the other. Taxes are not going down. I guarantee that. Not with inflation. We need the town needs to find alternate sources of revenue. Um, so this is just one way where it's utilized throughout the industry. So. That's something that we can do and have this further discussions when the administration has sets up a meeting with them. And I'm done. So I'm okay. that way. Okay. Uh, Council Bedwick. Um, I like where you're going with engaging in communication because that is one of my biggest issues with regards to how this is being dealt with is I feel like there has been little effort to actually engage in a conversation to negotiate some of these terms and more of an effort to get justification and support for the reason why we have it written the way we have it written. With the feeling and the sense that there's no room for council to budge or wiggle. So I do like what you're proposing for discussion topics and where to go with that. I also wanted to point out, I just took a quick look at this uh, breakdown and only two of the seven communities that we have stats on actually say their accommodation tax is gonna to go towards recreation. Everybody else lists everything pretty much but recreation. So the statement that everyone's pretty much giving something to recreation is not actually <coughs> accurate. There's only two out of the seven reference recreation infrastructure and or funding. Uh, and the other one with regards to other taxes going up, don't be surprised if you find that at least they're gonna prefer that to this just simply because an accommodation tax is targeting hotels only versus everybody in the community. So they're putting out an expense, they're putting out work, they're putting out effort. So uh, they might feel differently, absolutely, but I'm just saying that might be something that pops up as well as they might see that as an equal distribution versus a targeting one industry collection kind of thing. Worship. Uh, just a comment. Um, I don't think that uh, the comment of uh, council is, is uh, has its feet in the ground or its heels in the ground about making some changes to the to the bylaw. 
any member of council here at the first reading has an opportunity to say, I would like to see this paragraph changed or I would like to see this. We have an opportunity at any time to make that. So far, in, in a lot of our discussions, I still have not heard that. So it's up to council. If you want to make see some changes, then we have to be proactive in, in ourselves and make those changes as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, just, I, I, I'm reading into what the mayor is saying there, and I agree with that. But I think the consultation should be with the hotel or motel owners. Like I, I think we'll have to, lots of good input if we bring it to an A, to a positive side. What would they like to see? Where would they like to see it go? I think that would be a great. I'm not in favor of paying debt off with the recreation here. That debt was created by other councils and councils that I've been on. I don't think the hotel owners will pay for that debt that we created years ago or whatever, but I mean, I think it needs to be consultation with that and uh, see what they got for ideas. And, and they have some great ideas. What's the problem? Do you honestly feel that we're going to get somewhere with the hotel? Like, do you, I, I think they're, they've got their heels dug in so deep to this not have anything to do with this if they're so argumentative i don't know i don't know are they i don't, I don't know if we're ever going to get anywhere to be able to uh, with them i, I don't <coughs> think, i don't see that uh, leaving the ring from the thunder hill was the only one who was basically but um i think from murray uh you know from his whole um his, from his uh chat the other night i, I don't know if we'll, i don't know if we can get there with them. Like I said, administrations, we're going to have that discussion and, and see where it goes. Yeah. Well, two things from what I've been hearing is yes, on more than one occasion, I've been hearing they're dead opposed to this. However, if they have no choice and it's going to move forward and they've made suggestions, some of those are to look at flat rate fees, some of those are to look at giving them a voice as to where that money goes. And on that note, I would also maybe suggest in that discussion, maybe suggesting incorporating into this bylaw a committee where the accommodation businesses are given equal voice with council as to where this money goes from one year to the next. So that they can weigh in on making sure and feeling as though they have a voice in making sure that this money is going into things that are going to bring that circular of getting more people coming in and using their facilities. If they're the only ones having to collect this tax, I personally feel that's something that should be put on the table is, it also <coughs> speaks to our strategic plan of citizen focused uh, groups. So that might be something to put out there. I kind of know where you're going with that, but I'd be totally against that. I think councillors are put here to make decisions. There's some really hard decisions to make in the city. I think we have to be councillors and make those decisions for them. So, one or two cents. Okay, uh, we'll just time for one more final round. Uh, I was just going to say, no matter where it's put, I mean, I really, it, it's, it's saving our taxpayers, our ratepayers money, it's stabilizing our tax. Uh, no matter where it's spent, it's it's coming in. It's going somewhere. Yeah, it's going somewhere. No matter where you put it, it's it's a benefit to our community. End of story. Okay, so back. The only thing I want to say is also um, the last thing I want to say is just in I, Thompson for Jennifer speaking. Um, every year the council passes a resolution as to where that accommodation tax goes. Every year they, they put that forth. Is, you know, it's a yearly thing. So. That's your so, in between reading two and three, how do we get to that meeting? Does that be part of the resolution that we're going to vote on, or how, 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 where have we decided that yet? We we've, we've contacted the 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 group, the group, the, group, the, group, the property committee, I guess, call it. Uh, and we're trying to nail down a date. We have two dates right now. Okay, so they're interested in meeting. So, so 
to vote tonight, and then there'll be a meeting up prior to three. There could be changes done to the school biological vote. Yes, so I will be supporting. So, so back to the bylaw, is there any changes or suggestions to it as it stands that's been presented under the current draft that has the short-term rentals added into it that you will see in blue? As I mentioned earlier, C, I don't like, C. which is uh, going to infrastructure, as I recall, 32C. So you don't like it? So nope. That's so. Doesn't matter. We can still change it before three. Because uh, I don't see that there. Comes it's our CEO pool. Yeah, that that is not included in it. That's a that's a summary of the changes that have already been made. So that was the list that the first draft was made on, and we have changed that to only recreation and active living. Yeah, so I saw that later. Okay, fine. Thank you, Council Medley. Yeah, I would recommend that changes come to how uh, the rate in which we're collecting, and I would base that on a open conversation with the hotel. I would recommend that we change the section 32, I believe, off the top of my head that says where the funds are going, and do not isolate it to just recreation, but again, engage in that conversation with the hotels and see where they would best like to see those funds go. And I would also recommend the change in that we, even if this bylaw passes, it will not come into effect until we are able to 100% enforce <coughs> all aspects fairly between short-term rentals and hotel accommodations equally. changes before second reading. Okay, that is the end of that. Back to you, Your Worship. All right, thank you. So just on that, <coughs> before we go away from that for one second, when we're talking about making changes, you just took some notes down on changes. Council has, how has this change come to be? They don't unless council directs me to make a change. Right, and that's my resolution. Uh, or we can we can make changes to this bylaw by straw pool. Okay. If I have these listed, I'm going to need a straw pool from council okay. to say you know, these. Okay. Because at this point, it's been suggestions to be made. Correct. Okay. Uh, okay, so then we'll move on then to uh, recreation and cultural services. <coughs> Oh, sorry, Mr. Harvey. When is that straw poll going to take place? Uh, we could do it whenever council wants to direct me to. Uh, we can do it right now. We can do it during the special meeting. We can do it during the February 6th. You know? I guess go ahead. So how would we do a straw poll now when we have a network? Yeah, yeah two, two of the suggestions don't actually say what we should change the rate to. It says we should include the hotel in the discussion. Figure that out. Same with the revenue, where it should go. It should be uh, not just rec, but we should engage the hotel and the property owner. And then the changes that uh, the one that we could struggle is no effect or enforcement until the SDRs are dealt with for better lack of term fair. That's what I was thinking. Again, I think that's that's let's wait till after the discussion. It's all going to come up. Discuss it with the hotel and hotels first. We have a strong one. Council Watcher. After we set to, after our special meeting, I will make a motion for that. For what? The second reading to the vote on the, the bylaw as it stands or with any recommendation from the governor to change from. Well, the, 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 the resolution sits there now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But during, after the special meeting, like in the special meeting, once we discuss with them. 
Can we not make that motion during the special meeting? No motion, no. You, you, well, you, you can you add can. extra items to a special meeting under two conditions, that all councils here, and that you have a separate resolution approving those items to be and to discuss on the agenda. Yes. So each each extra item needs an, a resolution allowing it to be on the agenda. So then those three recommendations when we adopt the agenda for the special meeting, I will make a motion. They can technically those. happen in the cow right now under a straw board. But we haven't been able to talk to the hotel. Correct. So that's what I'm saying. So we need to talk to the hotel owners. Can we have a straw pool in the special meeting to have the second reading of the bylaw and make those changes in the special meeting and have the second reading? Uh, there's, there's no straw pools in a, in a regular no. No, special meeting. Okay. You either you have a resolution to vote, that's it. Yeah. Okay, then I make a motion right now to straw poll the council as it stands right now with the bylaw as it stands to have a second reading and then meet with them in a special meeting and then before the third reading implement any changes at that time. Can that, we do that? That's, that's what we yeah. are going to do. Okay. Okay, you don't have to do a motion to do that, but you I'm, can make a recommendation I'm and ask for a straw, straw poll. Okay, so before we get there, Council Bob gets a hand up, so I want to let him So I was under the impression that general governance was going to meet with these, that this wasn't the meeting time, that you were going to really, really sit down with them. Yes. After that. Okay, that's so, right. Okay. okay. We're at time two. Two, right. Okay. okay, so did you have something else to? No, I was just going to see you can't straw pulls in a regular right. session. Meeting. So then, so you want to have a straw poll asking what again? that we proceed with the second reading of the bylaw as it stands right now. Can't really do that. Yeah. Well, it doesn't mean anything. It's a cow, so yeah. We're having, that, that's listed on the special meeting tonight at 9 o'clock. Yeah. That it's exact resolution. kind of one of the point purposes of yeah. calling the special Yeah, that's meeting. what I thought. But then you're saying we can't do it at the special meeting, so then you said no, we no, can't no, do it now. No, you had, you had asked to make a motion for for uh, additional items deciding to make the changes by resolution if you wanted to do that in a special meeting then i need resolutions to allow those resolutions on the agenda so if there's three items to be added i need six resolutions three to approve each resolution right so that's in the special meeting i suggest i suggest we we got to meet with these property owners at either the February 6th meeting or if somebody calls a special meeting and follows the procedures, then we can have a straw poll or we can have literal resolutions stating that and that is solid direction to change the bylaw to what the rate will be, where the <coughs> revenue will go, and when will it be enforced. We could do that. Or if we have a, uh, an agreed upon Cal meeting before then, and we can have a straw poll so it isn't a formal resolution. Either way, we will be deciding what the rate is, where the revenue will go, and when the <coughs> enforcement will be. Right. Right. So the way I see it, it's a matter of process right now. We got, we got, we're in the committee of a whole talking about between first and second reading about the bylaw. We got some suggested changes that may be there, but we don't know what directions and that to go with those until we have the meeting with the hotel industry. Beyond that, tonight at the special meeting, the resolution's there, as with the current changes that were put on there to have the short-term rentals. That can either, there's a number of options that can happen with that, but then the intent, the meeting's been set up with the hotel industry to get their feedback thoughts and discussions on all these discussions that we had tonight those changes could be redrafted and implemented into <coughs> a draft for third reading that could be either amended or passed at that time right <clears throat> so even after we have the meeting with the hotel if we don't if we choose we can decide that we won't have the third reading until into um, February, not in our first meeting, 
if we're not ready for it. So anyway, there's a lot of stuff in the air because of that meeting that's going to happen with them. Go ahead. Um, <coughs> when we get to the motion that's tabled right now for the second reading, can we not make a motion to table it to a date to be determined once that hotel meeting happens and then bring the second reading back after that meeting has happened? Yes, a yes. motion can be brought to table at, at any meeting of council. Because I can tell you right now, if we vote on it the way it looks right now, I am still in opposition of it. But it, you, you'll need it. Yeah. Yes. Just, just you finish, and but, sorry, Council Megan, you finish, and then the Deputy Mayor can speak. And I'm not, I don't know how the rest of you feel, but to talk about changes being done between second and third, why don't we just table the second reading, have the discussions, determine, come back to the table in a cow, discuss what we will or won't modify or implement based on the hotel's meeting, and go from there. We'll wait. This is what happens in the, in the special meeting. Go ahead. One thing I was going to say is that if if such a motion is brought forward, it can't be just put it in. There has to be a date that has to be tabled to. Right. Not. Yeah. Well, that's why date. I was asking for clarification. Can we say a date to determine once that meeting? That's is what I will be asking. So, if that's the case. So even though, just to be very clear, so everyone understands. We will do that regardless for every tabled motion from now till forever. I'll be putting a date in the minutes. Still, a special meeting can be called <coughs> and a tabled item can be put on that agenda as long as it's advertised to the public. It, the same thing can happen. It's just, it's the process that we agreed on in our procedures bylaw and what we generally follow in Robert's rules. <coughs> so just so you're aware, just because we've tabled it to October 5th, it can be put on an earlier meeting. An earlier meeting yes. special meeting. All right. Is the dust settled there now, Mr. Harvey? I was going to say, would it make sense then if someone's going to table it to say, I thought they need to have a date tabled to the uh, second meeting in February and then it can be. I was just going to say the same thing point. because then we. Sorry. Mr. Harvey speaking. That was just my question. If if they do need a date, if they table to the second, and then if this meeting hasn't happened by that point, then we get tabled again. If that's what council decides, of course. Yeah. And then I guess my other question was, the meeting with the hotel owners are all council going to be there, or is that just a general government? Okay. All right. So I think we we went over that enough. Uh, we'll move on to um, recreation and cultural services. Councilor Boyshaw. I'm going to hand it over to CEO uh, Poole for the update. <coughs> yeah, just a status update on the project. My computer's frozen and it's not there. Okay, so um, I did attach the December 12th report for council just so everyone understands what it's going to take to get this thing rolling. The direction from council is is that you want to see a design on a new building from, from what you know, the decisions that we made. Uh, in order to do that, we need the design project manager, uh, construction manager, architect, <coughs> all of that. So the final agreement Unfortunately, Brad has not returned my call since Friday, so I, uh, I do not have a copy of the final agreement, which was promised to me last Friday. I, I just don't have it, and I don't have a reason why. Uh, we've been content in contact with him yesterday and today. Uh, hopefully, we get it as soon as possible. Uh, I did attach on the, the agenda a chronological report, so the message I guess we're sending is once we start this design process, it's, it's probably going to be tough to stop. So as long as council's confident <coughs> on what we're doing, no problem. If you, I have the direction. I have no reason not to do this. We obviously, the next resolution is to hire a DPM, but uh, that's the next formal resolution that needs to be made. But I think it's good for council to just sit back, take a look at the history, 
The blue is the retrofit, the orange is the new, so you can see the actions that the town has taken over time in the process of this entire project. Uh, as requested, the job description and the contract, I, I attach those as well. They're in draft form, they're not passed by council, so they can be changed, they're subject to change. Uh, the contract will be a negotiation on the wage side, but if there's any input into those, uh, take and then there's the, the the estimated 2024 budget now it's a it's a whopper of a number is it possible to get all of the whole thing done in 2024 if the decision-making process is extremely efficient yes definitely a design can be done in months so uh, if you know what you want but will it be I, I have no idea this is this is my best guess or estimate, I should say, on what this is going to cost us, because we are going to have to put the total amount of money, including the expenses that will be claimed for the ACSC, in our budget. And you know, the number one million, one point one is there. Is it going to hit there? We're going to try for it not to be. The other, the other assumption that I've made in this is that the 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 engineering firms and the architectural firms are all separate contracts. They might all be one. I, I really don't know. We'll get we'll get recommendations from the construction manager. Uh, I'm assuming that they'll be separate because they will be specifically taking direction from us, not the opposite. Uh, so that you know, very very typical between eight and twelve percent of an estimated total cost. I used fourteen million. Best guess, uh, and then the geotechnical analysis is not done. It needs to get done. We quoted that in 2021. It's just above twenty thousand dollars. Consultations with the historic research branch in Manitoba. I really don't know what entails with that, but five grand just for who knows what's involved with that. I've never dealt with that. But uh, the full environmental assessment. Uh, also required in the ACSC grant must be done. Uh, again, an estimated cost of a consultant to get that done. The mitigation and monitoring measures for as a result of the in environmental assessment are unknown, so I, I really don't know what that will entail. It depends on what comes out of the assessment. And then the adherence to the Manitoba Green Building Policy and Design. So I know that that's not lead, and I know that that's not I don't expect there to be a lot, but that number will be very tough to say this is what this cost. It's going to be built into the design. It's going to be a requirement for the architect and his team. You must adhere to this billing policy, and they're just going to do it. So to put a number on that, I, I really don't know how. So if, if, if our decisions on the Legacy Committee in the town are very, very efficient, if we get started like right away when the stars align, yes, this can all get done. But I, I don't believe this will all get done this year. This is just the most it will cost. Council Medwood? Um, well, when I was reviewing the agenda, none of this was there yesterday, so uh, thank you for your summary on all of it because I have not read any of it. Um, but your first thing that caught my attention was are we confident in moving forward with the design? And I'm going to sit here and say absolutely not. Until we have engaged in those conversations with our municipal neighbors, with our First Nations who have indicated they would be interested in partnering with us, until we have had those conversations, we are going to repeat potentially the pool situation if we go out and get a design done and then go talk to our neighbors. Because what if our neighbors don't feel that fits the bill? Then we just spent, what What did you say, 1.8 million? 1.3 million. And now we've got upset neighbors that want nothing to do with it and we're on our own again. So I really do think we need to slow down and we need to go engage in those conversations. So instead of rushing this, let's do it right. Let's have those conversations and let's see where they're at and at least give them the opportunity to get involved at this stage 
if they're not interested, it's not something they want, then they can tell us right now and we know we're going it alone. Not that we can afford it and will I support affording it, but then at least we know where we stand. But to go out and make a design based on our thoughts and opinions, when we don't know what their thoughts and opinions are, I think is gonna just, Councillor Bottle? Yeah, just uh, the word architect scares me. Uh, is that part of the grant that we need to have an architect? If we have a grant or not, this project <coughs> will have an architect. Why do you say that? Because it's required in the building code. We, need a, we will need an architect. An to wow, well, I beg to differ now. You can buy a pre engineered building, right? Yeah. So then why, I was under the impression this whole thing was going to be done by local people and local businesses and stuff so uh, I was under the impression that as it built the designs can change because you got a deal on this or you'd like change your mind you want to put it over there. As soon as you step that architect in there you can't change nothing. We are talking about we are talking about things that we told the legacy committee that they'd be dealing with. But uh, if we want to go down that road, like really the answer is the legacy committee has has chosen construction management. And whether it's design build or design bid build or construction management, uh, like you're gonna, an architect's going to be required. They will. They won't. Like if you ask, if you ask Clayton Holchek, like it's. I guess we. What engineer is going to? to we're getting into the weeds here. We, we don't need to be getting into. But uh, what engineer is going to take that line? To play on? There's no one engineering firm that's going to cover for the rest of the engineering. An architect to bring all of that together. Uh, again, I beg to differ. Thank you, Mayor Moria. Uh, a couple things when I reviewed it. Uh, just on your uh, report, this, I think you meant to say December 12, 2023, not 2013. Oh, wow. Yes, that is true. Okay, just will affect the future report search down the road. Yep, I'll um, change that. Then on your DPM job description, you've got term position, but there's no end date or end conditions. Same thing in the contract. Um, that'll be, in my world, the union would be very keenly interested if that is a position or a, a true term if there's no set conditions or actual end dates in the posting. You're right, I don't have an end date. It is a term position and it will end upon uh, award. Well, award. it'll be prior to award, the, the, the completion of the construction documents. Okay, so that would have to be, I would suggest in a, in a contract, <coughs> that that's outlined in there right here, because all it has is a start date, and then conditions for like termination, for both. but there's no actual language to where that uh, this term position ends, which I'm assuming, just based on what you said right now, is that once the tender documents come back, then that position ends. And then it's under, it's my understanding that uh, this uh, DPM is actually the individual that will be going around doing the consulting um, with the legacy committee and the neighboring uh, communities and committees to uh, come up with the design, correct? Like that's the person that's going to be spearheading that conversation. Yeah, he's, he's the town's engineers. Right, so, so that it's not him taking a town's plan and moving, like, footprint and moving it forward. He has to first, he's the one that's going to be stick handling and making these linkages and conversations with all those partners um, yes. to come up with a, a draft design and, and go with that. Yes, and be the main liaison between us and the legacy committee. So when we have, mm -hmm. where's the fundraising? He goes, he goes and gets it. We don't have to go to them. Mm -hmm. He goes and gets it. That's right. his job. So that's all part of that position is, yes. is all of that. There, there, as far as I'm aware, there is no set floor plan design right now. It's, no. it's all it's going to evolve with this person having those linkages and discussions with the legacy, the legacy committee and all the other communities as a group. And they have their discussions and meetings. And yeah. Okay. Um, just, just further on, on Councillor <coughs> Wadley's, the, the whole idea, it's not like we're going to hire an architect like the pool or, or this building. And they're going to tell us how it's going to be done. That that was kind of the whole point. We still need an architect, but we, because it's construction management, 
we tell that architect what to do when we need them to, not, not what is typical where the architect is laying out the plan for the owner. This is how this is gonna run. It will not be that. The legacy committee will be in control. The, the DPM with the construction manager will need an architect to sign off on the drawings and the plans and compile everything all together so it's all incorporated. So the electrical guy and the mechanical guy are basically tied into the exact same you know, tray and everything else so it works together. Architects are the ones who do that. Electrical guys do not design the mechanical guys' stuff, and they aren't courteous with each other. But they don't care. The architect is the one who compiles all this, and we want him to do the work when he needs to do the work, not when he wants to do the work. So he would not, he would not be under contract then. He'd be on piece work. Yes, it'll be CCDC based on work that we. So, you're, you want me just, to take over? Well, yeah, do you want to take over for a second? Go ahead. Um, <coughs> just to kind of speak to that, uh, reaching out to the surrounding areas, uh, Mayor Jacobson and I attended a meeting with the Swamp Valley Legacy Committee a couple of weeks ago, and it was that exact thing. We actually have obtained an update from them, and what our intention is, myself as the Head of Recreation and Cultural Services, I'm going to spearhead getting updates from them until we have this person or position in place or I can continue on after if they so desire. But getting that update from them and the town, putting it all together and getting it out to our First Nations, all our surrounding municipalities because that MOU is holding the Legacy Committee up. They don't want to go and make those discussions when they are not sure what or if they should say anything. So we're going to take it upon ourselves to make sure that everybody is in the know and in the communication right from the start. A lot of municipalities feel like they've missed something when in actual fact they, they really haven't missed anything other than the grant being applied for, getting it, and us having to figure out the logistics of how that moves forward. And until that's figured out, we're basically doing the end thing at the, the beginning now to save us hopefully the aggravation or disruption like it, it went or I guess make it smooth sailing from now on. So just you know, like that is definitely in the works. I actually have the update and uh, I'm gonna be reading and going over it and then getting all the contact information and sending that out to everyone. And that's, that's everything on that. Is there anything else to? Uh, just that I didn't get to overview my recommendation on process, uh, but everyone has read it. We believe it's time the transparency is needed and the confidence in the project is needed on the council and the public. Um, we give them what we have. We know we don't have everything, but we can give them exactly what we have, the truth. There's nothing There's nothing wrong with that, and we have nothing to hide. So, But we do think we, we it's time to let the public know exactly where we are on this thing. That's their advantage. Any other Ten, ten point one, snow clear, snow clearing policy. So this is one of our policies that we are taking a little bit of a dive into. Uh, yeah, uh, just a request from Councillor Midwood to discuss the the snow clearing policy. I believe the listed items in your email were. Uh, just enhancement of services, the MIT. Means I have for you, you folks. <laughs> In fairness, okay. the council, you should have these to us the day before. I finished them at 10 o'clock last night. <laughs> I revised what I had uh, previously provided so I could put a better presentation together. Okay, so. I'm gonna read through this. I kind of tried to prepare it similar to the way CAO does our uh, AMM stuff. So uh, for the snow removal policy, first thing is RFQs for contracted snow removal on town streets. It came up in a transportation meeting in November, I believe, or October. We asked for this to be done. I haven't seen anything on it, but as I review, the policy, there are eight sections of our policy that already account for this 
and allow for our director of public works to utilize his discretion in doing so. Those sections being section one, the town will utilize town employees, equipment, and or private contractors when necessary to provide the service. Section three, goal three, perform snow removal and ice control tasks in a timely manner. Uh, section three, the most critical time periods are weekday mornings. When feasible, the town will attempt to remove ice and snow from the town maintained collector arterial streets prior to rush hour periods. Section four, the town will solicit quotations from contractors at the beginning of each year for the purpose to provide trucks, motor graders, front end loaders, and other equipment as may be deemed necessary for the control of ice and snow on the town streets. Section six, if the situation requires operators to respond other than the regular work shift, the director of public works or his design E will contact the affected operators and contracted contractors. Uh, section 10, it is the departmental goal to have the streets passable within 72 hours after snow has ceased from falling, assuming general plowing operations beginning at 4 a.m. and snowfall ending at 7 a.m. Section 11, snow will be removed in the downtown core in such a manner that will minimize the disrupt disruption of a business operation within the downtown core. Snow will be removed on certain streets adjacent to schools in, within the community that will minimize the effect on school operations. The goal of the town, Swan River, is to clear the snow from the downtown core and streets adjacent to school areas as soon as possible to alleviate traffic and pedestrian disruption. Section 14, the director of public works or his, does, does, I can't pronounce that word, will monitor the street conditions to determine the timing and the number of crew and independent contractors necessary to clear town maintained public street system. So discussion topic is nowhere that I read in this policy does it state that the director of public works requires council approval by way of resolution to carry out any of the above mentioned actions or decisions. Uh, when we have s heavy snowfalls with our commitment to the airport there is a delay to service on our streets and meeting these targets simply because our grader can only be in one place at one time. It's a reality. So, uh, as I mentioned, the transportation committee met. We had asked for uh, Director Harvey to put out some uh, requests for rates and I followed up with an email just to ask whether or not a resolution needed to come to the table from council to allow that to happen. And in his response, it said, I have here, I have prepared rate sheets that are going out to the contractors. Once I have the prices back, I will let council know the rates and council can decide if they want to modify the policy. So policy doesn't really need to be modified. He already has that direction, that authority, and that trust in being able to carry out and do that. Uh, so, uh, where, I lost my spot here. The policy does not need to be modified. It already clearly gives authorization for rates to be obtained and for the Director of Public Works to use his discretion as to how snow removal is carried out by town staff or contractors or both. What would be beneficial is, in my opinion, a memo to be written, sorry, written and shared with administration, mayor and council clearly outlining that the Director of Public Works has council's trust in executing the policy <coughs> as he sees fit to meet the service targets currently existing within the policy in a safe and cost-effective manner, including using independent contractors. This would go towards our strategic plan objectives for transparent governance and citizen-focused services, so efficient communication inside the organization, strengthening uh, our internal administrative procedures by using memos, uh, provide sustainable and reliable services throughout our departments, the commitment to retention of staff by empowering and trusting our administration team to execute policies and bylaws with minimal micromanaging from council, uh, highly trained, productive, experienced staff, little turnover. I have faith and trust in our administrative team's ability to execute the policies and bylaws as we pass them ensure reliable and responsive service with minimal downtime so the past couple of years have proven heavy snow results in delayed service on the town streets due to greater clearing the airport 
allowing the Director of Public Works to carry out the policy, including the use of contractors for town streets, can assist in consistently meeting our targets uh, for the airport and town streets. Healthy and connected community ensure sufficient health services in our health care facilities. As our new Manitoba government conveyed at AMMs, it's not enough to have these services available. We also need to make sure that all people are able to access them, and that includes the state of our roads, airports, and transit, transportation services. Uh, support and promote community events consistently meeting the 72-hour goal for clearing our roads helps ensure everyone including our seniors and those with mobility issues are equally able to get out. As I was walking, I saw a guy out on a scooter on the road that's not always uh, accessible when we don't get those streets plowed. Uh, support and, com and promote community events consistently meeting the 72-hour goal for clearing the roads helps ensure everyone, including our seniors and those with mobility issues, are able to get out and about. Support of physical and mental well-being of our residents and visitors. There's, there was enough damage caused to our community and others uh, with the isolation from COVID, so let's not be contri a contributing factor for continuing that in the winter months. And fostering positive community environment and socially connected community. Um, the other sections uh, that come to question for me are section seven, sorry, I'm not good with my Roman numerals. Section seven, <laughs> Swan Valley Municipal Airport. I would want to just confirm, is all that information current and up to date? Um, if there's been any changes, maybe we should actually look at uh, going to a first reading to amend that. Um, I did not have a chance to double check, but uh, CEO Poole might be able to answer. I'm not sure if snow removal was included in one of those um, uh, amended bylaws that I said we need to see the bylaws that are in question. But we do need to remove section eight, uh, parking regulations bylaw number 23 slash 83, because I believe this bylaw was repealed when we recently passed the new parking bylaw because I think that had in it to repeal all few other past bylaws and section 9 the parking regulations bylaw 9 slash 2021 I believe this was removed from the current bylaw and therefore is no longer relevant um, section 10 12.4 uh, the section references unpaid expenditures to property taxes. Is it accounted for in that amendment bylaw that is going to be tied to that enforcement bylaw on how to collect on these fines? Uh, section 17, review of policy. Has there been any calls, comments, or complaints documented? We've had a pretty great winter for snow removal, but I'm just wondering if there's been any calls. Hey, that letter. Okay, perfect. Um, my second thing to consider here is parking restrictions slash bans during the winter season. So we have already received feedback from the public supporting the use of parking bans for snow removal, including enforcing through tickets and towing. So my discussion points are to give administration, straw poll, to give administration directive to survey staff, especially those who operate snow removal equipment or responsible for enforcing bylaws to attain their feedback and opinion on whether a parking ban would improve their work environment, prefer times to implement bans overnight day, oh sorry, during the night, oh, during the day contingent on snowfall until it's clear, things like that. Enforcement or penalties, ticket, tow, etc. and uh, so that would be my second ask, I guess. And council agreed to review feedback from both surveys at a future CAL, maybe in March or April, to determine if, when, or how to proceed with implementing snow removal or parking bans. So strategic plan objectives that this action targets is the transparent governance and citizen-focused services, so efficient communication inside and outside the organization provide sustainable and reliable service throughout our departments, uh, commitment to retention of staff, empowering and trusting our staff and frontline workers to provide feedback and input to ensure councils making informed decisions, 
uh, highly trained, productive, experienced staff, little turnover, uh, ensure reliable and responsive service with minimal downtime. So ensuring we're meeting the needs of our staff and frontline workers and providing the best possible environment for them to be effective and efficient in doing their jobs safely. So I guess my, if I go back to my three asks, I did do a good job of clearly putting those out. One would be a straw pool to provide a memo, to communi clearly communicate that we have faith in our Director of Public Works ability to administer this policy as he deems fit with the budget he, well, I guess gives himself in a sense, but council approves it, uh, and using whatever resources he feels fits the bill for getting the job done within the guidelines of the policy. So it's basically just the memo reiterating what's already in the policy. Um, and the other ask is for administration to poll the staff involved with bylaw enforcement and or clearing of snows that would be impacted on by any changes if we do consider pursuing um, a ban or parking. So just to gather the information so that it can come back to another cow for us to discuss how we would move forward if we even choose to move forward. All right. <clears throat> uh, so just some information on the contractors. Um, so I did send out the rate sheet, uh, but there was one that uh, I got back to me, so I'm not, I called him today, I'm not sure what happened, but uh, anyways, he said he didn't have it. So I didn't get a greater, so there's one greater that's $190 an hour, and uh, Another contractor is greater at two hundred dollars an hour, uh, but they don't have snow gates. So if we got them to go in town, then they'd be on the driveway. So if council wanted to use a private grader, I would suggest get them set up at the airport and then make some call for that. If council wants to use private, because uh, with our snow gate, it makes it so much easier to clear with the driveways that we don't have to go back. If the wing ever doesn't go down, then we definitely hear about it uh, from people that it hasn't gone down. So that would be my suggestion if council wants to uh, add on uh, private contractors to the current snow clearing. And I guess I would ask for a strong pull. Well, That's before we get there, there's there's a lot of information here that has to be you know looked at because uh, I'm, I'm, to my side, I'm not prepared for a straw pull on that, but I think Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Moore is first. So first, thanks for putting this information together. Um, it's well presented. Um, my suggestion is that uh, the policy goes back to administration to look at the obvious corrections that need to be placed, like reviewing the, uh, the bylaws that are no longer applicable. And then my second suggestion is that the uh, Public Works Committee meets with the Director of Public Works to iron it out and then bring it back to the uh, Committee of the Whole for final review and go from there. Uh, Councillor Bobbick and then CEO. Yeah, I like the private sector's always been there. You've known that for a so And over the years, when there was really bad storm, the private was always there. Again, the airport, I would suggest you stay away from private contractors have the equipment, you have the availability to do it right now. And again, going back to the streets with graders without the snow gate, uh, that would be kind of a kerfuffle. So I'm, I might, we need to talk about this because I, if you're going to hire a contractor, he's not going to come for two hours. I'm sorry. You're buying a day. You're going to be a minimum charge. So you're not going to fire a $200,000 machine for two hours with the snow gate. There's all these things with them. At the same time, there's been some conversations public works and through here that there is some ideas how maybe we can free that grader up in a lighter snowstorm so that will carry on in the future of the iron out of the Mr. Poole. Yeah, it was, it was basically Calendar Deputy Mayor Morio uh, basically said what I was going to say is there's a, there's a lot that needs to be thought about in terms of contracting for our services and 
sure for her, you can get that in the report. Uh, Mr. Harvey and then uh, Councilor White. Yeah, and just in respect to the <coughs> bylaws, um, so yeah, bylaw 9 2021, that one has been repealed. So that was just repealed in November. So that one will have to change, or well, it'll just have to be deleted because that clause isn't in the new bylaw. That was 8 2023 that uh, repealed it. And then uh, bylaw 2383, I checked the list and that one isn't. And we'll let administration clean that up for the committee. Go ahead. Uh, relative to a, a straw poll to uh, endorse your, your, uh, your job there, Mr. Harvey, I think the fact that council has given you those responsibilities through the CAO, and if there are any complaints or concerns, I'm sure we'd be talking to you. And the fact that when we do talk about the small, the trivial things, that you respond so quickly and appropriately, I don't need a straw poll. I, I think I'm pretty comfortable. We all feel pretty. Pretty happy with the job we're doing. Okay, so is that uh, going back to administration to clean that up and then have the committee uh, go over that then? Yeah, that's acceptable to me. Right. Um, for the <coughs> the straw poll for direction to poll or survey the frontline workers to get their feedback. We already have comments from the community, but it would be nice to also get feedback from the frontline workers who are actually involved in doing the work and administering the enforcement to then be able to decide how we would help that you are get some of that information already. We do we do but uh, I like the idea. I think we can draft up a survey like the online yeah, yeah. stuff we've been doing for the public. I know that the communication is, is there from admin to the employees. It's not as formal as that, but I can let you know. Yeah, like for instance, I met with them regarding the snow gate, because uh, that was one of the things that was brought up, but uh, they were in favor of keeping it, because they <coughs> felt that the manholes is one of the limiting speed factors with the grader, so they can't just go full out like they can out in the side because uh, otherwise if they get a manhole then it would damage the machine or hurt them kind of thing so that's one of the limiting problems so they have to go a little bit slow to watch for that and watch your curve watch for other things so they're traveling a little bit slower anyway so then it makes sense to have the wing because they're traveling at that speed anyways and then it's so it's like, so it's like we do have those conversations but we can get more detailed feedback from them Yeah, there's an ongoing conversation with the men and the staff that I'm on. That's all the time. There's some stuff I'll use tobacco, for instance, that'll come forward in a few weeks here. But, but we're always, there's always people in touch. Well, it's just along the same lines. Administration is entrusted to have two way communications with the, the, the workers and the staff that we have. So I don't think uh, having a straw poll to have a memo to direct administration to do that is required that's I think is uh, an expectation of administration's performance to do um, and in regards to the snow removal then it's they could it's up to them how they want to either it's a general group discussion at coffee or lunch one day or during the breaks uh, or in one of their meetings or some other written form where they want to put it down more so it's more anonymous who knows but I'll leave I have to trust in administration that that's their Purview to uh, keep that in the communication between staff and them back and forth. I don't doubt or question that those conversations take place. I, yeah. I know they do. All I'm looking for is if council is to take feedback from staff and also feedback from the community, it's nice to have it in kind of a, yeah. a similar format and have it documented so we can actually kind of see it so whether you want to take notes on the conversations you have or whether you want to do a little poll or survey similar to what was done with the public uh, so it's comparable and easy for council to digest that's all I'm suggesting so then we 
have a better idea to sit down and discuss whether this is something we do actually enforce and move forward with or whether we say, no, let's just work on our communication. But it would be nice to have feedback from both angles, the community and the frontline workers. So this will leave it with us. We will provide the transportation committee with feedback from the employees. Uh, like we can do it in a way that is anonymous, so maybe they would they would divulge something that say they wouldn't if the CAO went up to them and said, hey, how's it going? It's terrible, and you know, sometimes you're not gonna get that. So we can, we can, we'll find a way to get the committee the information that is being requested here in an objective fashion. Okay, uh, moving on then to 10.2, uh, Andy Bat. Now this one, I literally just got info like today that I added to it, so. Um, Again, you should have this before so we can read this far. I know, but I literally was <laughs> in the mini meetings today, two of them, to be honest with you, um, pertaining to this, which made me move on. Okay, so I did a similar format. So handyman, so the background. Minister's Forum spoke to funding for accessible and affordable transportation for citizens to be able to access health appointments, engage in community resources, services, and activities. Services to Seniors Board met with residents from Heritage Manor and Westside Lodge in November. Residents voiced concern that handy van cost per use was not affordable to people on fixed incomes. Uh, $16 for a round trip uh, is cost prohibitive for many of them. Uh, there was interest from seniors expressed for a shuttle service being offered so they could do their own shopping errands and attend social activities around town for example the senior center uh, seniors also asked why minotaurus provides a shuttle service yet town of swan river does not a uh, resident letter or sorry recent letter to council from service to seniors voicing seniors concerns on difficulty getting around town during the winter and i updated the population demographics to the 2021 stats. So the total population was 3989, age 50 to 64, 710, ages 65 plus is 1030. So our total age of 50 plus is 1740 or 44% of our population. So they are a considerable chunk of our population, almost 50%. And if you actually remove the zero to 19 age range uh, and look at it from a taxpayer perspective, those are actually contribute to taxes. Uh, age 50 plus population makes up 50% of the taxpayers. Uh, two meetings that I was in attendance yesterday and today uh, with TONES, I cannot remember what the acronym for, but it's basically transportation networking for seniors and support services to seniors meetings. A common thing across the board in both these meetings is unaffordable transportation services, especially in rural communities. Uh, through those meetings, I have made four uh, municipal connections to follow up on with regarding similar problems and issues. Uh, 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 adding diverse uh, representation, oh wait, where am I at here? For municipal, to follow up with regarding similar problems and issues. I'd like to look into adding diverse rep representation to our handy van board, which could give us connections we need to advocate for better funding and support on a provincial level and reduce burden on administration because we are not alone in this issue. So reviewing the Mobility Disadvantaged Transportation Program, which I believe is the grant ap application that was attached here. <coughs> Under contact information and governance for board members, I was not even truly aware and maybe it's an oversight on my part with being overwhelmed in year one but currently it lists all of council as the board. Uh, we have never had a board meeting to my knowledge or any kind of discussions on the service. Um, none of us even qualify for using the service based on what I read in that documentation. So is there anything preventing us from restructuring the board to consider representation from a combination of council members senior organizations such as services to seniors, senior center, and groups or organizations that represent people with disabilities. I don't know if ACL or Heroes Club, but Evelyn Yelenic would probably Yelenic. be, oh, I probably have a typo there. Uh, she might be a good connection for us making those connections. Um, 
It also indicated that if we serve two municipalities, Town of Swan River and Swan Valley West, <coughs> we could clearly identify from that documentation whether Swan Valley West actually contributes to it on a government level or whether it's just our client usage that contributes to it. Um, and clarification I was looking for in regards to if a driver is booked for a return trip, such as when Granny was picked up to go to the Timberland to join us for supper, is that driver paid to wait until Granny is ready to go back home and provide that return service? And in which case, this could bode and feed into <coughs> uh, my next interest here, which is providing a shuttle service and maybe keeping that driver occupied for those two hours while they're earning their wage. Um, it would be an in-town only service Reduced flat rate fee for round trip use, offered a few days a week, possible consideration to planning event outings with a diversified board, including representation from client user groups. This burden of planning and organizing could possibly be shared by the volunteer board members and their respective groups. Uh, one example of potential cost is if we were charging two bucks and we can fit eight people plus a wheelchair, if you include that, it would actually be $18 for a full van and the potential for multiple runs during that uh, shuttle period. Example two is at a $5 rate, uh, you would be looking at $45 if you also had a wheelchair on there, and the potential again for the multiple runs. So, uh, I don't know, it's, I'm thinking it's something we're trying. Strategic plan and objectives that are met are transparent governance and citizen-focused services. So it creates a citizen idea group by diversifying our board. We get more input from uh, those, well, groups that serve those that population that qualifies. Engages community with focused goals. Provides sustainable and reliable service throughout our departments. So commitment to the retention of staff. It might be easier to retain staff if we can give them kind of regular guaranteed hours of work. We might have also a reduction in uh, request cancel because the driver's not available. Um, engages community, oh, I read that one already, sorry. Highly trained, pr productive, experienced staff with little turnover, again, puts our drivers uh, give some reliable work. Uh, pursue cost-effective options, solutions, and technologies. We might find the shuttle service actually generates more revenue and s meets the needs <coughs> of 44% of our population that might be eligible. Um, more environmentally friendly while being economically sustainable. A full bus is better than running a single passenger. Uh, cost efficiency within organizations, so offering a reduced flat rate fee for a shuttle service that keeps the bus full and in use during the service time may provide more cost effective, uh, be more cost efficient than one of outings. Healthy and connected community ensures sufficient health care services in our health care facilities. Uh, as I mentioned, the government indicated that it's not enough to have the services, we need to be able to make sure we have affordable <coughs> transportation to get people there. Support and promote community events. Affordable shuttle services offered for community events could assist in increasing attendance and numbers. Support of physical and mental well-being of our residents and visitors. So affordable shuttle services offered could assist with increase in social outings, use of senior center, pool, etc. And even that indoor walking that's now available at the arena during the day. Uh, economic and cultural developing. Uh, organization and connection of social services within the region and find communities passion and use that to increase community involvement so by having a diversified board you get that passion because those are the people who actually serve and are in place to advocate for basically our clients that are eligible to use it so my asks of council are if we can agree to give direction to administration or even myself I'm willing to do it to write letters to groups or organizations who represent or advocate for clients who are eligible to use the Handyman Transit Service and invite them to join the Handyman Board to assist in making sure we're providing the best service possible for our citizens. Um, the other benefit to that is, as I've mentioned, by being on the Board of Services to Seniors, by now attending these other two meetings on behalf of the Board, 
I've already made other municipal connections who are experiencing the same problem. So I am going to be looking at it from an angle of seeing how we can maybe bring this forward to the AMM as a potential future resolution to lobby the government for funding. Um, and by having a diversified board that kind of takes the burden off of administration to be having to take this on themselves. Um, my other ask is to give direction to administration, and this could always happen after, but to give it direction to administration to create a survey to be distributed to all eligible handy van users to determine would they use the shuttle service, what would they use it for the most, be it medical errands, social outings, activities, preferred days or hours of the shuttle service to be offered, what they would be willing to pay for round trip service, put some ideas out there. I know you guys might be reading that pay what you can, but don't, don't knock that because the Bozeman Lions did a fundraising breakfast to raise money for the Legion Hall in Bozeman and they <coughs> offered it for free, donations welcome. If they had charged 10 bucks a plate as they normally would, they might have made about a thousand, maybe $1,200, but having it free by donation, they actually brought in over just over $2,400. So to say pay what you can may not, may result in getting more and for those who can't afford it, they may pay a lower rate. But it's just something to throw out there as a consideration. Um, and then I just have a couple notes here that service to seniors may be able to help uh, circulate the survey to residents of Heritage and Westside Lodge and I'm willing to check in with the senior center to see if they'll allow for members to take some back to their buildings and or neighbors, et cetera, to help <coughs> make sure it gets out to that demographic, because uh, not everybody's gonna use computers. Uh, and so my, what I wanna ask is, if we are willing to give direction to administration to broaden the diversity on our handy van board. Uh, for council, I'm willing to hold the appointment of Councillor White here is actually on the Manitoba Age Friendly Committee with me, so he might also be interested in remaining on the board and then maybe opening up the other seats to some of those other service groups to help us. And then that way it takes the burden off the administration if we do try to pursue some other methods or means of utilizing the handyman. One contact I did make in my meeting today, and I, sorry, but I cannot remember what community comes to. We're going to connect through email and see if we can have a phone conversation to continue the conversation. But he indicated that the municipal government gets the grant money for the handy van. Their legion actually operates the handy van. And then they have their service to seniors group doing the dispatch and booking. So there is a collaborative effort on three groups and organizations to make that the best service possible in that community and I do want to ex further that conversation to see what can happen. So straw poll, are we okay with asking administration to draft the letter and send it out to some of these organizations and users groups to first see if there would be interest in them joining a handyman board and we can take the rest from that point if you want to leave it at that for tonight. So before we get to the draft, um, or, or, or sorry, uh, um, I'll give about maybe six minutes, 10 to, before our meeting at nine o'clock and we can always return to this if we need more time and then we have one more item on the agenda. So we'll just have some discussion <clears throat> and then we can get into that, into that if we have more time. So, if you remember. Okay, just a couple quick points. <coughs> uh, I can confirm that Swan Valley West, under the last shared service agreement, they contribute to the handyman. Okay. We don't know where it stands. <coughs> that it's right now. Okay. Okay. Um, what one reference had it in brackets? Does that to me indicates a negative? And, so and then, um, see, folk, you need to confirm that since the financial, I believe, the board is there is a constitution of the handyman for a board. Uh, which spells out representation, so that may be a challenge to just bring on other people. The constitution may need to be required to change. And then lastly, uh, as in other communities, uh, I'd be interested to know if the service to seniors wants to run the handyman, put a proposal together and take the operations off 
it's an entirety just like it does in other communities like St. Rose and others that where municipalities are part of the board with a rep but funnel um, grant funding and that with it but uh, the entire operations is operated by the uh, service to seniors group or whatever group. We kind of went down this road once before, I thought. Well, I, I can private. provide yeah. some answer. Our current funding doesn't actually meet our current operational needs. So if that was to be entertained, is that coming with money from the town to help us, well, by us I mean services to seniors, actually operate that I'll service? Yeah. So that would be the one question and then also what i would have to take back to the board is whether we would be allowed to entertain that type of a, an agreement while also having this contract with pmh for um, service to seniors because that's who actually does our funding with pmh so i am willing to take that back to the table um but i guess what i would want to know is would funding come with that for operations well council have to make that decision go ahead yeah just to echo always willing for a community group to take over a, a service like this if that could be done we are absolutely 100 percent for it uh, on the second just just to let everyone know the the funding that we do receive is is tied to the use of a handy dance service which is is defined as mobility disadvantaged people using this service. So we get funding for this service to be used by mobility disadvantaged people, which is defined by an individual who, by reason of illness, injury, age, congenital abnormality, or any other permanent or temporary incapacity or disability is unable to utilize available transportation facilities. They don't meet that criteria. We don't get the grant money towards that. So if we open up, there's kind of two issues here: is is we're expanding the service, which you have to pay for if we do a shuttle, because the grant money won't cover a shuttle; it'll cover the a handy van. And so, and then the second thing is, if the shuttle service is free, I, I'm sure that the disabled persons will not be happy that they have to pay. Uh, just a non-disabled person gets it for free. I would imagine that will come up as well. Just points. Okay. Uh, okay. Just to clarify, I'm looking for it to still be used within its parameters, but many of our seniors, especially the ones living at like Heritage Manor or um, Westside Lodge, they already have mobility issues, um, but they can't afford to use the handy van at the pay per use rates. And so they were inquiring about having that shuttle service. Uh, it might be used more, we might find in the winter as well, when maybe they, you know, don't want to brave the cold and get the walkers out. Um, but may, I'm looking for it to service those that actually already qualify for it, and then just basically have a period of time where we will literally go around and pick them up at their residence, um, if they're still in their own homes or at the, the manners and stuff like that so it would still fit that i'm not asking for it to be free that was just kind of something to throw to put out there but we don't even have to put that on the survey but it was just to get an idea or a feel in that survey as to what they would feel would be a fair affordable flat rate fee to use that service and then we can maybe kind of go from there because i mean if people are willing to say well yeah i actually it would be fair to pay 10 bucks to have a round trip well then we don't necessarily need to start at five or two we can look at okay ten dollars it is kind of thing. that's all i was looking at to put that out there but yes i would be looking at it for that reason but just a segue on that one of the things coming up is and this is coming from i want to say Prairie Mountain Health representatives, but I could be wrong. But why, why do people have to have a specialist say you qualify for the service? Why can't somebody's actual condition be in a, well actually no, this comes from one of the people in the meeting who has disabilities herself. But she was not allowed to use handy transit because she had not had a, a letter from a specialist designating her eligible for the service. So that is one of the things that is happening within these groups and meetings, these talks that might be some advocating happening to say, hey, 
Yeah, why is that? So uh, that's why I'm thinking if we build these connections and these relationships and we tie them to our board, then we already have connections to potential resources for funding if they come down the pipe or for advocating for improving services. So yeah, just that. Um, okay, maybe we can go back to that straw poll. Do I have permission to we, work? We're going to go, we're going to take a break right now and then we'll come back to this after the special meeting. So, all right. Everybody ready to go back? Councillor Powell say she was not going to leave? She had to leave. Okay, so I just need a clarification. Okay, so we were on um, Handy Van on Councillor Midwood's request for a straw poll for something I can't remember. Um, well, I was amending it because I would like to maybe have permission from council to work with CAO Fuller administration just to see one what the constitution holds with regards to our board restrictions as Deputy Mayor Morio mentioned and then we can maybe bring it forward to another town meeting for further discussion as to whether if that is an option to diversify our board or not and whether council will entertain um, sending letters at that time. So may I have council's permission to work with administration and pursuing some avenues of that nature. Yeah. Discussion. Discussion. Yeah, yeah, I have no problem with that concept whatsoever, but before things went out from this office, I would like to see what that would look like. Oh, yeah. 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 Any, any changes to our operations council will have to be updated. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, CFO Gadita. <laughs> CAO Pool, can you uh, maybe uh, discuss some of the history of the attempts to approach multiple community groups to take over the handy van in past years? Uh, I guess I can't, I can't recall the specific groups, but we've just been, a, you know, just a very extremely unsuccessful, including neighboring municipalities that have existing operations to community groups that seemed to be interested in the operations, but when it came to any responsibility or organizing of it, it all, you know, we want to tell you what to do, but we don't want to do it. So that, that's, that's the history, I guess. Well, very short summary of the history, just extremely unsuccessful in finding volunteers who are going to operate the, the service, yeah. which is why we can't run it at a break even. Because if somebody wants to run it, they're going to want to make something out of it too, right? Yeah. yeah. And with, with the community group, with volunteers, with the, with the provincial programs available, it, it can be done. Other communities do it quite well, actually. So we, do, we haven't been successful in finding uh, a group to be able to do it. All right. So all the question then is support the uh, council amendment being part of that process of looking at the board and, and coming up with a strategy on perhaps um, revising the board book and, and moving forward. All in favor? All right, yeah, there you go. <coughs> All right, so then we'll wait on that then. Uh, we're gonna go ahead on to topic <coughs> three on the indemnity bylaw. Um, actually, I don't have right now for um, Director Clausen and Mr. Harvey, there's no need for you guys to continue on with us. <coughs> If you want to stay, you can. If you've got, you're sick, so you should go home. So, yeah. uh, it's some of all these people memes or once I start coughing. Then... Yeah, me too. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> you're staying here. <laughs> all right, so then uh, we'll just give a minute and then we will uh, discuss. <coughs> okay, so we can resume then. So the indemnity bylaw. I I don't have a proposal. Uh, I put the bylaw up just for discussion on where we where we want to go. Do we want to continue with the 
the monthly reports in the max 25 meetings. I know that we discussed increasing the, the annual indemnities and calling it a day. Uh, I, I threw it out here just for suggestions from council. Good morning. Good morning. Um, while I'm an advocate for just increasing the indemnities and call it a day uh, to make it uh, easier for myself and administration, um, looking at this, we had, made a, or we had changed this part way through the year, so it was like a catch up learning curve, creating new um, templates for how to claim it. So I think I'd be okay with leaving it as is for this year, to try it for this year, and if it fails or success, we can decide that uh, come November, December next year. Uh, well, I know where you're going with that, but at the same time, if we talk transparency, there is no way in the world that a rate payer can figure out what we're getting paid, because you don't know if you're going 20 meetings, 23, 4, 10, or 6. So if you're not a, scared of giving yourself a raise, it's 25, 25 meetings times 10, for it's to $637, you give yourself 50 bucks more a month, it all works out. Done. That's why. I think I like this new proposal that we've been doing for six months. It's uh, easy to handle. And we do reports all the time at all our meetings. If you need to be concerned about it, look back at the video and it'll tell you how many meetings we've been to or anything. If I recall correctly from the original documentation, you gave us a comparison to what other municipalities are doing. Everybody's kind of got that separation, which to me is kind of transparent in itself because it's saying here's what you get paid in your monthly allowance for and here's kind of what's happening sort of above and beyond that that's being done but I don't know how the rest of you fill out your forms but I'm trying to be as detailed as possible in my notes for even my own purpose and records because for example uh, communities that care to our meeting, but since we want them to have it in monthly, I'm probably going to claim a day. If it's not this month, it's going to be next month and account for the two meetings, but I'll put a little note in the notes column saying which meetings they were for and how many hours combined so that I know for myself because I'm trying to, okay, we can only make one claim, but I still feel like I owe two hours because I'm getting paid for two hours that I wasn't in a meeting. So then the next meeting, I'm not necessarily claiming, but I like to make that note to know that I've accounted for it in my own records. But then also, if somebody from the public were to come say, I want to see that, like, what is it? They're also going to be able to see those little notes and know that, okay, yes, I did make a claim for a half day for a meeting that only took an hour, but then I also didn't claim specifically this, this, and that because I accounted it towards already being paid type of thing for time but um, that's just me and for my own accountability so I mean if you really want to be detailed in your transparency you can maybe put some extra notes in too yeah um, okay well go ahead um just from my point of view like, um as being the deputy mayor and the chair of general government there's especially this year this is going to be a heavy year um with, uh, as it always is when shared service negotiations go on, which is this part there. Um, but for myself and then with the other committees that are going on in that, um, and then when you factor in AMM and the G4s, uh, you're, you're not claiming all your needs. Your 25 run will run out. I will run out before June with the, the 25. So it's a, people are just have to be aware they're gonna have to pick and choose uh, which ones they they claim and if they want to claim every one until they run out of 25, that's so be it until the reset, or unless there's a motion by council to extend that. All right, and then I think <coughs> that if there's no other discussion on that, if someone wants to bring a resolution forward to make otherwise changes, so be it. Councilor Bobbick and then CEO. So, is there any idea how much time does this take administration to monitor all this? That's actually what I was going to say was uh, we are okay with leaving it as is. I think it was a bit of a punch to our own gut was the retrofit of January 1. I think, I know, I know council heard a lot of flack from administration, but that was to be expected. It was the first go. It was for the whole year. Now that the, the deadline to get it in by the following month is in, it's not that hard to, to follow council to submit. We have 
a tracking system, it'll be it'll be just fine. So we see it easing up quite a bit compared to that that first run, which was the whole year. So yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, and that, now that you mentioned that the deadline to the following month, I don't see that written in the the bylaw. So that but we did. But we did have it. Because I don't, see, I know we talked about it and that there was the retro, but I and we all agreed to it yep. at one point. But after reading this today, it's not recalling that it's actually in there. Just a housekeeping thing that if it's not, stick it in. If it is, great. It could. It can be just a policy too, can it not? You can. Uh, bylaw supersedes a bylaws. I realize yeah, we'll, we'll put it in the bylaw because we don't have a policy for this, so, yeah. so we'll, we'll put it right in the bylaw. In there. We'll make sure I make that. So second reading will go with that change plus the changes that you see. Which is, uh, All right, Councilor Boychuk. Is that form going to be amended like the request we had requested? Uh, yes. So we're we're working on. Uh, getting that like online so you can submit that PDF whenever you want. Yeah, is there like a button at the bottom you just do it and then submit to and it clicks it to the email that it goes to or it should go to? Yes, we have to, we'll, we'll have to activate, that's another thing we're looking for in the budget is activating the all net forms. If we activate that, then we can do that. We can do that with a whole bunch of other forms as well. But <coughs> until we do that, we can give you the fillable form, but not the submit and it automatically gets filed. We don't have that. But these will be accessible on Allnet to each individual, so you can go back and make sure. Yeah. Uh, get the memory. Um, just not to the, the bylaw, but to the, the claim form. Can that drop down box that, that Mr. Wilders provided add like an other or something? Because when you go through it sometimes, some of the meeting that you go to just not just fall into one of those yeah. committee meetings, it's other yeah. stuff. Even if it's just an other like a catch all or something that you can just write in. Yeah, we can add a spot where you can type in. Mm -hmm. All right, for the discussion. <coughs> All right, so um, being done. I just want to clarify like in schedule B. Like the half day, full day. Like I know, does it say up there where it's like two hours and four yeah, hours? Yeah, up in the up in the bottom just, says. I'm just wondering if that could not be put down in that schedule B as well. So it's you know half day in brackets, two hours, full day, four hours. So it's in B in additional indemnity. It's actually under four hours, over four hours. So anything yeah. under four hours, half day. It's over four hours because you're full day. So we can put that in there. Anything else? All right. 13. Resolve this committee. The whole meeting being now adjourned at 9.20 p.m. Moved by Councillor White, seconded by Councillor Bobbick. All in favor? It's carried. We're adjourned.